The following program is sponsored by the Association of the United States Army. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the show that delivers insights on federal government programs, people, and operations. I'm Mimi Gerges. The annual AUSA conference held in Washington this year brought together nearly 40,000 people, members of the defense industry, international military allies, and top U.S. Army leaders, including the Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth. We sat down with her for a one-on-one -on -one interview. Secretary Wormuth, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. The Army fell short of its recruitment goal by about 15,000 recruits uh, last fiscal year. How did that happen? Well, it was a number of factors. I mean, as you know, it's a very tight labor market. Uh, unemployment is very low, so everyone is out there competing for talent. Uh, we're up against companies now that are offering, you know, $20 an hour, for example. Some of it has to do with the pandemic and the fact that our recruiters haven't been in schools for the last couple of years. Kids, I think, have suffered some learning losses, and that's showing up in terms of fewer uh, young Americans who can meet our standards. And some of it is frankly, you know, related to more underlying causes. Um, unfortunately, only about 23% of young Americans qualify these days to go into the military. And a lot of that is about obesity. Um, and some of it also is about just a, a, only about 9% of young Americans are interested in serving in the US military. So it's a lot of things wrapped together. So what are you doing that's different and innovative to address that? I think the most innovative thing we're doing right now is something called the Future Soldier Prep Course. I think of it as sort of like a mini boot camp. It's for uh, young Americans who already want to serve, but maybe didn't score quite high enough on our academic test, or maybe didn't quite make our physical fitness requirements. And through this boot camp, we are working with them to raise their test scores or to raise their fitness level so that they meet our standards and then can go off to basic training. Are you going to be expanding that program? What's the, what's the plan for it? I think there's a good possibility that we're going to expand that, Mimi. The early results we've seen so far are promising, uh, and so we can potentially expand that to some other locations uh, where we do basic training. Are you worried about this downturn in recruitment that could actually impact readiness? At this moment, I'm not too worried about it impacting our readiness, but certainly if we are not able to turn around some of these recruiting challenges, I think it could have implications for our readiness. So that's something that we are uh, looking closely at and working through. You know, there is proposed legislation right now that would allow DREAMers to join the military and have a pathway to citizenship. Do you agree with that? Well, I think we certainly have to look um, and think creatively about how we can expand the pool of young Americans who are uh, interested in serving. And I, I am aware that uh, I think Senator Duckworth has put forward some legislation along those lines, and she is in discussions with the Department of Defense about how that program might work. How are your retention rates? Our retention rates are good. Uh, better, frankly, than, you know, even 100%. And so I think, you know, that says a couple of things. One, it's very helpful, obviously, in terms of maintaining the size of the Army we need. But also, I think it says the Army's got a really good story to tell uh, because people who join the Army want to stay in the Army. So I think we've got to get that positive story out there more effectively. You know, many military families are struggling, especially with the rising costs due to inflation. What are you doing to help them? We're doing a number of things. Uh, starting in January, we're gonna be offering something called basic needs allowance to soldiers who qualify. We have uh, raised the housing allowance in 28 military housing areas around the country where rental costs have sharply increased. Uh, we have programs called Army Emergency Relief that can make loans or grants available to soldiers. And we're looking at, you know, we, we are basically funding our commissaries at 100% so that ideally our food prices there will be 25% less than they are off post. And we're looking at how we calculate our housing allowance to make sure that it really reflects the real housing market that's out there. Well, speaking of housing, uh, a big issue is military housing and barracks. There's mold. Soldiers are calling some conditions unlivable. Um, what's the Army doing to, to address those concerns? 
That's something I'm very concerned about, and there too, we are working hard to solve those problems. Uh, for example, in some areas like Smoke Bomb Hill Barracks at Fort Bragg, we are just tearing those barracks down and rebuilding them. We've moved soldiers out of those barracks so that they're not living in unsuitable locations. The Army is investing over a billion dollars a year in barracks for active guard and reserve soldiers. Uh, we're going to be doing that for the next eight years at least. Uh, I want us to look at, you know, is that enough money for barracks or do we maybe need to spend more? We're also spending more money on our Army-owned family housing and we're working with the five companies that do our privatized housing to make sure that, we're, uh, that those companies are investing enough as well. You know, I want to turn to mental health. Uh, this week, DOD released data showing military suicides have jumped 40 percent between 2015 and 2020. How is the Army bringing their numbers down? We are working hard on this. Uh, and, and I will say, while one suicide is uh, one too many, this year in the Army, we've seen our suicide numbers go down. Uh, I believe that our numbers are down 20 percent compared to last year. They are also down when compared to the last five years. So the way we've been getting after that is we have put out um, a new uh, directive on suicide prevention. We are really trying to make sure that, our, that we're surging uh, the right kinds of resources, behavioral health specialists, chaplains, military family life counselors to places where they're most needed. You know, Alaska can be a challenging environment. We had seen some suicides there, so we really surged resources, and I think that's been helpful. And we're also really trying to emphasize the programs that we have that can help soldiers with some of the things that are often correlated with suicide. For example, money problems. You know, we have financial management planners who can help marital problems. We have programs to help with, you know, happy marriages. Um, substance abuse, and we have programs again to help soldiers with that. So we're really trying to take a comprehensive approach. Sexual assault rates have also jumped. Um, there is a report released in August. As the Secretary of the Army and as a woman, I know these rates are not acceptable to you. They are not acceptable to me, absolutely. And uh, for that reason, one of the things we did this summer was establish something called the Office of Special Trial Counsel. This will be a one-star uh, you know, lawyer, basically, who will report directly to me, and his office will be responsible for trying sexual assault cases. You know, We are taking that out of the chain of command to try to rebuild trust with our soldiers that those kinds of cases will be handled better. Another really important thing I think we're doing is we are hiring what we're calling prevention specialists who are helping our commanders better understand you know, what are the patterns where we're seeing, again, some of the underlying causes that can lead to harmful behaviors like sexual harassment. We have already hired 80 of these prevention specialists. We're going to hire another 200 next year. And by FY27, we hope to hire 1,300 prevention specialists. And they'll help not just with sexual harassment, but with things like suicide and other kinds of harmful behaviors. Just a quick pause here, and then we'll come back and continue. Great. Coming up, we'll continue our conversation with Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth. We'll be right back. We're back now with Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth. Uh, Madam Secretary, as you know, we live in a very polarized political time. Your inclusion and diversity efforts have been criticized as harming readiness. What's your response to that? My response to that is, you know, when I go out and see our soldiers all around the country and all around the world, they're focused on readiness. They're focused on war fighting. Uh, but we have soldiers, obviously, from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of parts of our country, and it is important for everyone to feel valued. Uh, and, it's, and I hear from soldiers, you know, sometimes who are maybe from Hispanic American communities or African American communities who don't always feel fully included. And so our diversity and inclusion programs are really about making sure that we're building cohesive teams because that's what we need, frankly, to be effective when it comes to war fighting. Turning now to the war in Ukraine, the U.S. has spent, sent billions of dollars worth of weapons there. And there's been speculation that because of that, this is harming uh, American readiness. Will it? 
We're monitoring that very, very closely, and we are not going to get ourselves in a situation where the assistance that we're providing to Ukraine is going to be fundamentally um, threatening our readiness levels. You know, every time the Ukrainians come with a request for assistance, we basically do a cost-benefit analysis. And I think we are, you know, working with our other services, like the Marine Corps, for example, and working with industry, we are finding ways to get the Ukrainians what they need, but also make sure that we're maintaining the readiness we need. The Army has also increased its presence in Europe uh, since the start of that war. What are some of the ways that the Army is specifically helping in that effort? Sure. Well, first of all, we have army, you know, we have about 40,000 army troops, I think, at this point in Europe, and a lot of them are reinforcing our NATO allies, uh, particularly in the eastern flank, you know, countries like Poland, the Baltic republics, but also in Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, Bulgaria. What they're doing there is basically training with the armies in those countries uh, so that they're demonstrating combat credible power to deter Russia from doing anything that would violate Article 5. And then, of course, we're also doing a lot of training of the Ukrainians, training them on the systems that we're providing them, and then helping also collect all of the equipment that other countries are donating to the Ukrainians and working to get it uh, where it's most needed in Ukraine. You know, as you watch how this war is unfolding, what strategies would you change for the army as a result? I think when I look at what's happened in Ukraine, uh, frankly, it validates a lot of what we have been planning to do looking to the future. So for example, you know, what we've, what we've seen with the Russians is uh, when the Russian soldiers use their cell phones to talk to each other, they can be targeted and they can then be killed. So we need to make sure that we are developing our forces so that they have very low signatures and that they can't be targeted in that way. We need to make sure that our command posts are very mobile, uh, and that is something that we had been working on, but I think what we see in Ukraine validates that. What we're also seeing is, you know, there are, the drone threat is very real. You know, that has played out very visibly in Ukraine, and again, we are very focused on developing our counter UAS capabilities because we know that that drone threat is going to proliferate. So in talking about, you know, the Army of 2030, um, you outlined six areas that the Army needs to focus on going forward. One is seeing the battlefield at all times. What does that mean? What that means is, again, uh, you know, if you can see the battlefield, you can see where you are to avoid threats, and you can see where the enemy is to, you know, as we say, find, fix, and finish them, basically target them. Uh, and so, you know, anyone who can, who can basically generate that transparent battlefield is going to have an advantage. And that is what we are trying to do. So we are, you know, working from basically ground all the way up to space to develop sensors and to be able to take the data from those sensors so that we can have that more transparent battlefield. And our adversaries are working on that as well. So we have to be able to learn how to protect ourselves in that environment. You know, in keeping up with the pacing threat of China, the Army is developing hypersonic and directed energy weapons. Where are you in the development of those technologies? Well, on our long-range hypersonic weapon, uh, we are far along, actually. The ground equipment for the long-range hypersonic weapon is being uh, trained with already out in Washington state. And we are, you know, planning to basically have the prototype for the actual weapon itself uh, developed by next year. We also were well along on our directed energy programs, and we expect to have prototypes for them uh, in FY23 as well. And beyond the prototype phase, then you've got to start producing them at scale. That's right. Is that going to be a problem? Well, I think one of the things we're looking at when it comes to scaling up the directed energy weapons is the costs. You know, the, the great thing about the directed energy uh, weapon systems is that it's like you have an unlimited magazine, sort of like in a video game where you never have to worry about, you know, running out of ammo uh, with your weapon. But the actual weapon system itself can be costly. So I was just talking with industry today about how we can really try to drive those costs down so that we can scale them up in a way that's affordable. Another quick pause here and then we'll come back. Great. Coming up, we'll continue our conversation with Secretary of the Army, 
Christine Wormuth. We'll be right back. Welcome back. My guest is Secretary of the Army, Christine Wormuth. Another area that you're very focused on is making the force more joint, and that's a big focus for this year's Project Convergence. Can you tell me about some of the successes you've had so far with those Project Convergences? Obviously, this year is just kicking off as we're taping, but in the past, what success you've had? Well, I think one of the things uh, where we've had success is, frankly, just bringing together uh, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Space Force to work with us. And really what we've been trying to do is see if, uh, you know, we can get our weapon systems and our sensors to work together with each other so that we can share data, so that we could potentially get uh, you know, data from an Army radar and give that to an Air Force F-35. That's the goal that we're all working towards, and we were able to do that in last year's Project Convergence. This year, we're going to continue working with all of our other services, but we're also bringing in the Australians and the Brits with their actual operational units to sort of have them join and show that we can scale it up to really a combined operation, not just a joint operation. And it's interesting that this is the first time we're bringing in international partners, not just to observe, but to participate. And it would seem that that's a focus also to increase participation and integration with allies and partners. Yes, I mean, you know, basically the United States very rarely goes to war by itself. You know, when you look in the last 20 years, we've, we've worked closely with our allies and partners. And I think we fully anticipate having to do that in the future. So we need to be able to build interoperability with our closest partners and figure out how to solve some of those operational challenges together. Where would you say the Army is struggling the most on its path to modernization? I think for us probably the biggest challenge is that we have a lot of different initiatives underway all at the same time. Uh, you know, we are trying to sort of prototype or field 24 systems in fiscal year 23. And, you know, the Army has a lot of different systems that we're trying to develop. We've got ground vehicles, we've got attack aviation, you know, we've got network programs. Um, so just, you know, making sure that all of those programs are making the progress that they need to make all at the same time is challenging. I would also imagine, you know, you're, you're under a continuing resolution at this point. So there's no new, new things able to start. What kind of an Im impact does that have on the Army? Well, certainly if we have a long continuing resolution, that will be a problem for us. You know, with, with 24 systems that we're working on, we don't have a lot of slack in our timelines. And the longer a continuing resolution goes on, the more potential there is for schedule slippage. And that concerns me. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a lot of practice operating under a CR. So a short CR is probably manageable, but if it drags on for months, I think, you know, it would become much more of an issue for us. You've said before that the Army faces hard choices balancing transformation, current readiness, future readiness, and then taking care of soldiers and their families. How do you choose? Well, unfortunately, Mimi, we can't choose. You know, we have to be able to walk and chew gum. We have to be able to sort of answer the president's call as we did in late February and be ready to go in a week's notice uh, over to Europe to reassure NATO. We've got to take care of our people. We can't have people living in unsuitable housing, for example. And we have got to modernize. You know, we are still using a lot of the systems that we developed in the 1980s. So those are all imperatives. And I think, you know, probably the hardest job for General McConville and I is managing, you know, every day, literally balancing those different priorities and uh, trying to make sure that we balance them effectively. You've been talking at this conference about the Army of 2030. What does the Army of 2040 look like? I think the Army of 2040 will be in a lot of ways uh, a, an extension of the Army of 2030, but with more use of artificial intelligence, with more emphasis on autonomy. Uh, I think you would see probably advances in terms of biotechnology and how that would be integrated into the Army. So those are the kinds of things I think that we'll see more of in the Army of 2040. And what's your strategy to get there, to get everything in place so that we do reach that? 
Well, a big part of my strategy is not waiting until 2030 to start thinking about 2040. So I've asked the commanding general of Army Futures Command to start now thinking about what are the new operating concepts we need? You know, what's the next MDO for 2040? What are the kinds of capabilities that we need to build in 2040? To start thinking about that now so that we can start working with industry to look at what kinds of foundational investments we need to make now so that we'll be ready for that next leap in a few years. What do you want your legacy to be as Secretary of the Army? Well, one, I want to make sure that we deliver the Army of 2030. You know, I think that is very important, and I certainly hope that the time I spend as Secretary of the Army will make us able to realize that. But I also do want to reduce harmful behaviors in the Army. You know, I think we owe that to our soldiers and families who are already part of the Army. But given the recruiting landscape we face, if we're going to continue to bring young Americans into the Army, we've got to show them that it's a workplace where they can be all they can be. All right, and we'll end it there. Secretary Wormuth, thank you so much for being on the program. My pleasure. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the federal government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges. The previous program was sponsored by the Association of the United States Army.